it's all over the house, but several of them are designated specifically for tiny, tiny shoes that never end up in these baskets, ever. And, and so uh, every day, multiple times, but usually uh, when I'm the most tired and most cranky, I am picking up tiny shoes all over the house and throwing them in these baskets. And, uh, and you know, the baskets are overflow because, you know, kids outgrow their shoes constantly. Wyatt apparently is now wearing the same size shoe as Crystal. And, uh, but just tiny shoes all over our house. Uh, and, and despite asking the boys constantly to pick up these tiny shoes and put them at least in the baskets, if not away, God forbid, in their rooms where they belong, we're just picking these shoes up all the time. And uh, in fact, I was, I was down in our wetland. Our, our house, our property has um, some wetland next to us, and I found one of the boys' shoes from when they were three years old, and it was uh, stuck in the sand in the mud uh, when I was down there a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I found <laughs> one of their shoes from when the twins were three. And, uh, and so for me, it, it was the shoes. Everybody had their connection point, but, uh, but for me it was the shoes that connected me to this picture that shook the world on September 3rd, 2015. You probably don't remember the date or why uh, that date was important to me, and, and that's fine because I'm bad at dates as well. I've got a pretty terrible memory. Um, but Crystal and I were lying in bed that night, and uh, you know, like all couples do, searching Facebook to see what was going on before we fell asleep. And, uh, and I don't remember who saw it first. Uh, but for me, it was... It was the shoes that caught my attention. And social media and print media and news media um, just exploded with the pictures. And news anchors had to hold back sobs and journalists were typing on tear-soaked keyboards. And uh, people around the world were outraged and heartbroken all at the same time. And everybody had something that they noticed first about the picture. For some, it was the, it was the red shirt. For some, it was the, the blue shorts or the uh, that funny little positions that all kids sleep in uh, with their face down and their butt up in the air. But for me, it was the shoes because Everett and Griffin had shoes just like him. Alan Curdy slipped from his father's hand after three hours of struggling to keep his head above water. As the five-foot waves came crashing over their heads hour after hour, their little rubber raft that the smugglers had promised would take them to safety didn't hold a chance in those seas. And Alan's brother and his mother also slipped beneath the waves. As his father continued to dive as deep as he possibly could, to pull them up for one more breath of air. But after three hours of fighting, it was not possible. And Alan's body was found the next day as the tide gently lapped his face. And it was a Turkish police officer that gently lifted him. Took him to his dad. And that picture of him being carried off the beach, it reminds me how I carry my boys to bed when they fall asleep downstairs after watching a movie or <clears throat> from our bed when Crystal uh, snuggles the boys and reads my book. And as we laid in bed that night, looking at those pictures of Alan on the beach. I so desperately wanted to scroll along in that article and, and see a picture or video of him getting back up and, and running along in the sand and having a great fun time at the coast with his brother and mom and dad in the background as his tiny little shoes filled up with warm sand. 
and I was outraged and I was heartbroken. And it was just a week before that that officials in Vienna found a, a white delivery truck that uh, was pulled off onto the side of the highway. And all over Europe uh, exploded with these pictures and this story of officials opening this truck to find the rotting corpses of 50 little boys and girls and parents and families who had been convinced by the smugglers that they would take them to safety from their war-torn countries. And it was Omran's picture that rocketed through social and traditional media a year after that. Exactly a year after that. The little boy that lived in the city of Aleppo who was carried into a mobile hospital unit as his city was being absolutely destroyed by relentless bombings from Russia and his own country. As Syria was sprinting towards the current mind-numbing tally of over 500,000 dead and 11.5 million refugees who have fled their homes in the last seven years. And that's just from a single country. This doesn't include all of the other unspeakable and unbearable atrocities that cover our globe. Reports have been coming out this week, you've probably seen them, of the 1,475 children that have gone missing who were taken from their parents who illegally brought them over our borders. And now they're lost. We don't know where they're at. And they're feared to have been sold into slavery the sex trade, child labor. I saw just yesterday that uh, Ireland voted to legalize abortion, joining the United States and other countries around the world. <sighs> you know, our number right now in the United States stands at 60 million legal abortions since Roe v. Wade. You ever feel overwhelmed by what's happening in the world? To the point where, where it's so massive that how could I do anything about it? Maybe for you, it's not the global stuff that bothers you. A lot of it for me is. But maybe for you, it's your family stuff. Something that is, seems so overwhelming and so impossible that you are out of control and you have hardly any hope for the future. Well, let me remind you this morning that you're not alone. Will you stand as I read from Scripture and we hear from the prophet Habakkuk this morning, this evening? Dang it. I'll get there right when we move. Hear from the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 1. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you don't come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Must I watch all of this misery? Everywhere I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The laws become paralyzed. There's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, and so justice has become perverted. Take a seat. Well, welcome to Oasis. We're in this series called uh, Perspective. The desire and the goal of this, this series has been to, um, is to get outside of our own lens. The, the way that we see the world, the way that we've been brought up and taught to see the world, whether by our, our parents or our culture or our church or our nation or, or whatever it is that colors the world as you see it. The desire has been to, to set those things aside and to look through the lens of God to look through God's eyes and to hear through God's ears the cries of the people of this world. 
and hopefully, God willing, to feel with the heart of the Father. The book of Habakkuk takes a brutally honest tone. And Habakkuk, as he regards and writes about the violence and the oppression and the corruption and the brutality and the pain and the suffering that is happening in his city of Jerusalem, God's city, there's no holds barred with Habakkuk. He is frustrated and he is angry and he wants to know why God hasn't done anything to stop this. I hear you, man. I hear you. The opening chapter of Habakkuk, this, this first half of this chapter is Habakkuk's call to God. As his heart cries out to his heavenly father and says, you got to do something. You have to do something. We're dying here. We're drowning. Our country is on fire. And it echoes and it resounds with all of those who have been through the reality of pain and suffering. He looks around at his own countrymen and he sees what they're doing to each other. And he laments to God about what he sees. The problem that he has is he sees God doing nothing. Now, there's nothing really that I can tell you about Habakkuk himself. A lot of this series has been um, uh, me kind of geeking out about history and, and getting to show you one of these weird sections of my world that I really enjoy. Um, but there's not much known about Habakkuk. Um, we know that he lived in, in Jerusalem, most likely. That, uh, that he lived right before the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians, which would fall um, in 586, but you don't need to remember that. But other than that, we don't know anything about this guy. Uh, in fact, of all the prophets and, and literally all the writers in Scripture, we know the least about Habakkuk as far as his history. You know what we do know about him very, very clearly? We can hear his heart and his frustration. <laughs> because he lives in this city, this city Jerusalem, which is supposedly the city of God. And it has descended to such a state that he's having a ridiculously hard time understanding why God hasn't done something. The law that's supposed to be the, the guideposts for the people is completely impotent to do anything about what has completely infected the people. Sin, pride, selfishness, and greed, and corruption, and brutality, and violence. Those, those stone tablets that Moses brought down off of the mountain have not been able to penetrate the stone hearts of humankind. The law is not working. And he's frustrated because God doesn't seem to be working either. You ever find yourself in that position? Where you need God to do something and all you get met with is silence? And so Habakkuk calls out to God. Calls out God. It's interesting because in uh, the prophet Ezekiel in the 36th chapter begins to kind of address this issue where God makes this promise that one day he will remove the stone hearts from man. These stone hearts that the law has not been able to fix. God is going to one day remove our stone hearts and replace them with hearts of flesh. And in that moment, God will come and his spirit will live within us. And that through that, not, not through some outward laws that are forced upon us to do right, but by an internal desire, the very heart of God himself living within us, we will want to do right. 
that it won't be forced upon us. It will just naturally come out of us one day. But Jesus hasn't come yet when Habakkuk is lamenting to God. And the Ten Commandments just weren't doing it. And neither were the 613 other commandments that were designed to elaborate on the Ten Commandments that the Jewish people were so apt to not follow. So God responds to Habakkuk. After Habakkuk calls him out and, and, and yells at him, you know it's okay to do that to God? Do you know that it's okay to voice your frustration and your anger to God? To verbalize your thoughts and your emotions when you can't take it anymore? You know that's okay? That God can take it. And not only can God just take it, but God actually desires that. And that as you pour your heart out to God, God will pour his heart out to you as well. Scripture tells us that. And we see it again here in Habakkuk. Because God tells Habakkuk, take off your blinders. You don't see me working, that's because you're only focused on you and your city. But what you don't see, Habakkuk, is the Babylonians. What you can't know right now that I'm going to fill you in on is there is a tide coming. There is Babylon rising in power, and they have taken out the Assyrians, and you have no idea what is going to be on your front porch very, very shortly. And listen, Habakkuk, because these people are brutal, and this is what you need to do. You have to repent. You have to begin to prepare yourself. Because in a situation like that, it is God alone who can save you. And the people of Jerusalem were in desperate need of this warning. But as we've seen time and time and time again, they just don't heed the warning. And so Jerusalem is besieged by the Babylonians and it falls and there is incredible death and pain and suffering once again. And at the end of this very short three-chapter book, Habakkuk ends with this phrase. Even though the fig trees have no blossom and there are no grape vine, grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. Despite all of that, despite everything that I see around me and the pain and the suffering and everything that I cannot fathom, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength and he makes me as sure-footed as a deer. In September 2015, the world was captured by the image of Alan Curdy, his cute little round face buried in the sand. Our hearts broke with compassion and with outrage. There was national and international uh, outrage and, and pressure that was put on our government to do something. To do something, to, to figure out a way to make this stop. To end this plague that had been unleashed upon the people of Syria. There was outrage. And there were broken hearts at least for a little while. Because, you know, give it a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, school starts up, you know, it was fall of 2015, and so, you know, the presidential election was kicking up, and there was all kinds of news going on there, right? And then the Me Too movement started, and Hollywood elites and, and Washington politicians, there were all kinds of salacious allegations, and you know, there was other stuff on the news and there were other things going on. And school shootings continued to 
sweep across our nation. And we were pulled in a million different directions, all of which were worthy of our time and our attention. The question that I'm left with at the end of these three short chapters. When I'm done reading Habakkuk, the question that I ask myself over and over and over the last couple of weeks is what can I do? Honestly, what in the world can I, a single guy, do to infect any kind of change when it comes to these global atrocities? What can you do? None of you hold incredibly important political office. How in the world is it that we're not going down the exact same path that the Hebrew people were for hundreds and hundreds of years during the time of the prophets? Right? These claims of Habakkuk are exactly the same as the claims that we heard the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before for the last six weeks have we been, we've been walking through these minor prophets. Do you not get this over and over and over? It's the same thing over and over. Corruption and lies and oppression and brutality and violence and greed and self centeredness and pride. It's the same thing, isn't it? Over and over and over. And you turn on the news and it's exactly the same thing. Over and over and over. What chance do I have to affect any change? What can I do? What I'm hoping that you're getting in this series is what the prophets are calling over and over for the people of God to remember. It's the fact that how we treat people, how you treat people, how I treat people is a direct reflection on my spiritual life and my maturity in God. Do you understand that? When, when you look at the, the Old Testament law, half of the Ten Commandments are about God and half of them are about people. When you look at Jesus and how he answered the, uh, the question, what is the greatest command? Half of it was about God, but the other half was about how you treat people. The new command that Jesus gave his disciples at the end of his life, love one another. That is how people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It is all about how we interact with one another. The way you treat people is a direct reflection of your spiritual maturity and how you're doing with the Lord. And let's just be honest here. It's how you get a second date, isn't it? Because when you go out on a date, the entire purpose of it is to watch how he or she treats the waiter or the waitress. And if they treat them like they own them, that's a deal breaker, right? Didn't your parents ever tell you that? Watch how they treat the waiter or the waitress. That'll tell you if you're getting a second date. Is that right? Nod your head. That's right. You should tell your children that. That is how it's done right there. It's all about how you treat people. All of this, all of the prophets, Jesus said all of the Old Testament and the law and the prophets hang on this. You love God, and you love people. And you show how you love God by loving people. They're connected. And without both of those, all is lost. That is what the prophets have been prophesying about the entire time. It's all about how you treat one another. None of it has to do with theology. None of it has to do... It's all about how you treat one another. So... The question is, what do we do with that? When our world seems to be on fire and our country seems to be splitting down the middle, you are but one person. 
what can you honestly do? Let me leave you with two things. Two things that won't have an immediate fix on Syria. And it won't have an immediate fix on any of the other things that we've been talking about. It's not going to overturn Roe v. Wade. It's not going to fix Ireland or any other country and all of their issues. But I believe these two things are the start of everything. And the first one is this, cry out to God. Take a page from Scripture and follow the example of Habakkuk. Cry out to God and demand action. Demand that God do something. Ask why this is happening. Ask for clarity. Do what Habakkuk did and call God out for what you're seeing in the world. And ask for the power and the voice to do something about it. God wants to hear your heart. Did you know that? Your Heavenly Father wants to know that you actually care what's going on. It is a sign of your spiritual maturity that things break your heart and that you go to God asking for answers. So cry out to God. Because the reality is, God will answer you. And you will hear from the heart of your Heavenly Father. The second thing is this. Habakkuk's story is finished. It's been written. Jerusalem fell. That story has been written and published, and it's done. Those people have no hope any longer. But our story is not finished. It has not been written or published because we serve a God who is a God of redemption. And therefore, there is hope. It may seem like the world is burning around you, but there is hope. And it's moments like these that I find incredible hope in the life of Jesus. Not because he was God, but because he was man. He was one man. During his entire ministry, he never traveled more than 50 miles from his house. He didn't, he didn't go and preach to governments and nations and search for better policies. He invested in people, individuals, 12 guys. And it was because he invested in those 12 guys that our entire world has changed. You are here in this building because of these 12 guys. It wasn't a policy change and it wasn't a governmental overthrow that Jesus was after. It was 12 individuals. And it was the reality of his death on the cross and the power of his resurrection and the Holy Spirit that allowed those 12 guys to spread the gospel to every nation on the planet. And through them, the most powerful countries and militaries, the most corrupt governments and slave masters were brought down. And it was through love. Over the last 2,000 years, this gospel of love, not theology, not military might, but a gospel of love has been subverting the most powerful in history. And slowly but surely, the gospel makes way. You and I have that same power. You have the exact same power and authority that the 12 did. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have the exact same Holy Spirit that Peter did? And John? And Andrew? Do do you understand that? That they were willing to go up against Rome. Rome, and if if you're not a history buff, that's not that big of a deal, but Rome. (laughs) Oh my God. Rome fell because of this gospel. The gospel that resides in you and in me. 
And it's moments like this when I, I look around and I think, God, this is not possible. What can I do that I'm reminded that it's not me? That it is the Holy Spirit and it is my obedience to that Holy Spirit that topples governments, that sets captives free. Church, let me remind you that what you do matters. How you vote matters. How you spend your money matters. How you talk at work matters. How you raise your children matters. Every decision you make, even your posts on Facebook, matter. Because the world is watching. And they're not looking at you, they're looking at the Jesus that you claim. The gospel that you have deep in your soul. And you are representatives. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. What you do matters. The band's going to come back up and we're going we're gonna to close out with one last song. And, and as they do that, I want to leave you with a question. The, the question that rattles around in my head all the time. What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that that stirs up outrage in your soul when you see it? What is it that that if, if you were to sit down with coffee across the table from God and the, and the two of you were able to, to have this discussion, what would it be that both of your hearts break over? And how are you partnering with the Holy Spirit to change that? What are you doing? We, we've got a little um, uh, Rubbermaid tub tote thing out in the, uh, in the lobby. Some of you saw it. We, we have families from Syria, this war-torn nation, part of these 11.5 million here in Salem. I got an email two weeks ago saying that we've got four new families coming in from Syria, and they need clothes, and they need shelter, and they need food. But you know what they need most of all? They need people. They, they need people to come together. There, there's this organization, Salem for Refugees, and they are helping to put together teams of people that will, that will mentor, that will come around these new families in this brand new country, in this brand new land, and be their family, their support structure. They're looking for church. There are opportunities everywhere for the gospel. And I don't care where it is, but find what breaks your heart. Find what brings outrage to your soul. When, when God says, you found it, and do something. Because the reality is that we need God. Desperate. Our world desperately needs Jesus. And if we don't do it, who's going to do it? With church. This is what we do.